let's let's welcome Dr. Howard Donner. And there he is. Wow, that actually worked. All right. <laughs> I think you're muted. <laughs> I'm I'm faking it. I'm just trying to make you nervous. Oh no, that's great. So, um, Howard, b- before I kind of turn you loose, because I know that these topics are not suited for a short 30 minute conversation. I know that when you lecture, you lecture for two hours, three hours, sometimes on any one of these single topics. But yesterday when we were talking about hypoxia, we got into hyperventilation. And I just would you know, like to ask you to start there because you said some things about hyperventilation that I've just never heard anywhere else. Um, one of which is who the heck carries a paper bag around when they're flying, <laughs> right? So you had some some practical strategies for somebody who's in the airplane and panicking and experiencing hyperventilation. Do you mind reviewing some of that? No, sure. And the thing is, and you, you might have a barf bag, I suppose, um, but the problem with rebreathing through a bag is just that, you know, people that are hyperventilating may in fact need oxygen and the diagnosis can be tricky. Maybe somebody's having an MI, a heart attack, you know, pulmonary embolism, maybe there's something real going on. So having them rebreathe through a paper bag, they're literally not getting any oxygen. They're just rebreathing their air and that's building up CO2, which is good. A lot of the symptoms associated with hyperventilation are caused by not having enough CO2 by blowing all your CO2 off. So rebreathing CO2 is good, but not getting oxygen is bad. So how can you uh, sort of provide your pilots or patients with an increase in CO2, but still allow a little bit of of oxygen in? So there are some things you can do. Um, The first thing I would do typically when I'm with somebody and they are starting to do this, oftentimes if you can just get them talking to you, that helps. So just start a conversation. It's hard for people to hyperventilate when they have to think about forming sentences, and it helps them to center and focus and collect themselves. You can have somebody breathe into just cupped hands, and that can help. Uh, But probably the best thing to do to limit ventilation is just to keep your mouth closed, close one or the other nostril, and just breathe through one open nostril and it's just hard to get a lot of of air back and forth i know you used to be a singer in a band called citrus in chicago long time ago and and and, uh i know you you had talked to me about using a straw for diaphragmatic breathing purposes so you can do it by uh breathing through your nostril but if you're somebody like yourself who has been trained to diaphragmatically breathe sometimes yoga uh students and practitioners know how to do that, uh, that can also help to slow your breathing down. You're trying to get away from the <laughs> and into slow, deep, diaphragmatic breathing, hopefully inhaling through your nose. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And I think that's that was the key thing that I heard there is it's really just about getting people to slow down, and there's lots of ways to do that. Um, another question, and by the way, I'm seeing here in the comment stream, somebody's asking a question, hypoxia is the situation where you have a lack of oxygen. So I suppose I jumped right over that point. But yes, for everybody watching, hypoxia is a lack of oxygen in the brain. And there's multiple ways to become hypoxic. Uh, We talked about, you know, going up in altitude, experiencing reduced barometric pressures is probably the most common way pilots experience it. But also fighter pilots and air show pilots can force the oxygen out of their brain. Um, The bottom line is, yes, hypoxia is a lack of oxygen in the brain. Is that that's a true statement? True statement. Actually, hypoxia isn't necessarily the brain, but it's the organ that we are most concerned with. Any tissue can become hypoxic, meaning low in oxygen. Hypoxic just means hypo from the Latin under or low and oxic as in oxygen. So hypoxic just means low oxygen. But it's our brains that affect us the most when we're flying. But any tissue, your heart can become hypoxic. And the problem with hypoxia is hypoxia leads to tissue damage and ultimately ischemia and cell death. So, but for flying purposes, when we talk about hypoxia, we're talking about the brain. 
Yeah, good. That's actually an awesome segue because somebody else asked a question um, about why does hypoxia occur at lower altitudes at night? And it's always been my impression that it, it doesn't necessarily, but it's more about the eyeballs. It's true. And uh, that is a long story that I'm happy to go into with you sometime on a webinar or something. But the bottom line is that uh, the requirements in terms of the chemicals that we use to supply our our rods with the neurotransmitters necessary for night vision are impaired on um, uh, at night. Our night vision is impaired by lower oxygen, so our night vision is not as acute. And hence, the FAA suggests this is not a regulation, as I think most of your viewers know, but a suggestion that at nighttime above 5,000 feet, we use supplemental oxygen, and above 10,000 feet, we use supplemental oxygen for nighttime flying, and especially nighttime instruments. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, this is, I know, one of your favorite topics, but somebody's asking, do you recommend flying with an oximeter? <laughs> so, you know, of course. And uh, it's so funny. We don't have time for this. It's funny. I love to schmooze, you know that. But... <laughs> The first time I used an oximeter was in a, a chamber uh, protocol in Boston, and we had oximetry, and I couldn't believe it. We could actually look at arterial oxygen saturation without putting a needle into somebody's artery and getting a blood gas, and the machine was like, it was almost, the, it was about half the size of a dishwasher, and we'd hook it up to the ear, and I think they were $100,000. They were made by Hewlett Packard. And it was funny. And then, you know, a decade later, we're using them in the emergency room and they're the size of a toaster. And, and now you can buy them on Amazon for 25 bucks and they go on your fingers. So it's been a fun evolution watching the sort of broad usage now of oximeters. And I think if you are a pilot and you fly above 10,000 feet for 20 bucks, yes, you should have an oximeter. I know I've heard you talk a little bit about this where it's, I mean, I don't even know how to even, uh, I'm trying to kind of summarize what I've heard you say about it, but in some cases it's like, you know, the digital airspeed where it's, it's too much information, 76, 75, 74, 73, 75, 76, you know, how important is that number? Well, there's two answers. It's super important and not. So since it's often all we have, it's super important. And if you're flying with an oxygen system, we didn't talk on your Instagram feed at all about high altitude flying, but high altitude flying is risky business uh, for unpressurized airplanes. You know, we all head up there and it's funny. I mean, you know, I look at what finer points stands for. And in many ways, if I had to summarize your whole brand, it's standard operating procedures, you know, building in the same kind of redundancies and operating procedures that the airlines have, well, there's very little redundancy when you're flying on an oxygen system in a piston aircraft. You're up, as I used to do, I used to fly a Turbo 206 for gentlemen in Telluride. And we would commonly get above the weather and we'd be in this little, you know, piston flying at 22, 23, 24, 25,000 feet. Um, there's no room for error there. And how do you know that your oxygen system is working? I ended up installing a little flow meter in the tubes that hung down, so at least I could see that they were green. But one redundancy is fly with two pilots so that one pilot can observe the other. And the other redundancy, it's not a redundancy, but the other check is do uh, serial uh, saturation checks. And as you know, and I'm sure some of your viewers know, um, in the new G1000s, for example, in the Cirrus, they have a hypoxia warning and the whole bit. I think that's a great idea. Most of us don't fly late model Cirrus aircraft, and we don't have the hypoxia warning on the panel. You're familiar with that, right, where you have to continue to push buttons or the G1000 starts getting nervous that maybe you've become unresponsive. So it requires a certain series of button pushes. Otherwise, there's a hypoxia alert that you have to respond to, and if you don't, the plane will has an automated system for going lower. Wow, I didn't know. I don't think I've seen that. That must be the, the newer software, newer yeah. models. 
Um, and it's a it's a fantastic idea, and I think it goes down to fourteen thousand. And maybe some of your viewers will say, you know, Donner's way off on this. As I recall, it goes down to fourteen thousand, and then you have to push some buttons. And if you still don't respond, I think it goes down to eleven thousand. And I guess you just hope you're not flying over Mount Whitney. Yeah, right. You know, and but you know, back to your point about. Um, oh yeah. Be, being up, well, just being up there at high altitude. I mean, the the few times that I've taken, like, of course. The SR-22, they say it can go to 25,000 feet. So what do you do the first time you get in when you try to take it to 25,000 feet? Uh, but it's not a particularly comfortable place to be in an airplane like that, you know, up in the flight levels. And um, for me, I always point out the the fire risks associated, just how much time it takes to descend, you know, that, that that's a risk you're taking on. Uh, but certainly the hypoxia thing is definitely something to think about. Um and I didn't, I didn't answer your question about the oximeter. So oximeters are great. You can check your oxygen. My only point about oximeters often is, you know, on expeditions back in the olden days, when you were the only one with an oximeter as a doctor, because they weren't readily available, you know, climbers would come at you like this, check oxygen, check oxygen, you know, climbers from all over the world, check oxygen. And it, it seemed funny because I would always be more interested in just how they were feeling. And people can have higher sats and not be functioning well, and people can have lower sats and be functioning pretty well, so that there is a lot of individual variability. So in no way would I poo-poo the use of an oximeter. Often it's all we've got, and it's nice to know that your sats are at or around 90% or above. But if I was flying with you and your sats were 87, and you were feeling sharp and able to do math, and... Uh, I would be less concerned about you than somebody with a SAT of 92% who was getting stupid. So it's just one variable. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and sometimes it seems to me, because I do fly with one, especially when we go out in the mountains, we don't typically have oxygen, right? But we're flying at 11,000 feet all day, sometimes popping up above 12.5 to get over ridges and stuff like that. Um, is it in my head that if I take a really deep breath from the diaphragm and then fill my lungs and count to five and stick that thing on my finger that the number goes up? Is Not it at all. Immediate? No, yeah. no, it's immediate. And uh, in fact, uh, there is a guy, ah, I forget his name, but he's the Iceman. I don't know if you've read about him. He's kind of popular right now on YouTube. Have you heard of YouTube? Um, I have, yeah. And, <laughs> and, and uh I forget his name, but he sits out on the ice and he can hold his breath and he does all these things. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And he's been studied. And, you know, part of what he does is just voluntary deep breathing. And he has a breathing technique. And there's no question that you can do it. The only problem with deep breathing is that most of us can't persist. And we can deep breathe voluntarily for so long and then we just forget and then our sats drop again. You, it used to always seem funny to me in the emergency room or anywhere, examine a patient, and I'd listen to their lungs, and I'd go, okay, take a deep breath, and they take a deep breath, and then I'd say, take another deep breath, another deep breath. Then I'd want to listen to their heart, and I'd say, okay, breathe normally. And they'd go, like, how do you breathe normally when you're <laughs> thinking about it? You know, you, you can't. Um, and so, you know, typically, unless you're thinking about breathing hard, which works, you're going to stop. So on mountaineering expeditions... There are all sorts of techniques for pursed lip breathing and so-called grunt breathing. Um, I won't go into detail. I'll just tell you there are techniques at high altitude to increase your oxygenation, and they work. Unfortunately, they don't work while you're sleeping, so people still get sick at altitude, et cetera, et cetera. And usually people can do this for an hour, and then they forget, and then they you know, deteriorate. So it's complex. Yeah that's, yeah, that's fascinating. And there's also someone asking about acclimation, saying if the FAA recommends oxygen above 5,000 feet at night and they live at 5,000 feet, do they still need the oxygen at night? There is some degree of acclimatization. It always seemed funny to me. Um, you've heard me say this before, but my house, when I lived in Tellier, I'd lived there for 10 years, my house was at 10,000 feet. Hmm. So it, it seemed kind of funny. Um, you know, I would fly out of Telluride living at 10,000 feet and I'd go up above 12.5. And as you said the other day, I hope the FAA isn't listening, but uh, I, I would fly for more than 30 minutes and not use oxygen because I lived at 10,000 feet. Uh, so in answer to your question, the one thing that is very clear after spending years working, living, doing research at altitude is that human variability is profound, and that's true for altitude acclimatization. So I would say to the 
viewer that's asking, it would depend. Um, if you're having trouble with your night vision, um, certainly even if you're acclimatized, using oxygen may still be helpful. But to what degree depends on your innate genetics and your previous acclimatization, both. Got it. And this is sort of a related question, but Frank is asking, is it correct that older pilots should use extra oxygen at lower altitudes to prevent early fatigue? It, it, it's true. Um, there are a lot of things about aging brains that are different than younger brains. And do I have time to digress for a moment? Because it's very interesting. Yeah, I think everyone wants to hear it. Okay. <laughs> So one of the cool things, in fact, you know I like to show slides, so you know, here, here's, here's a slide of uh, some of the things that change with acclimatization and adaptation. And one thing that's very interesting is as you get older, you're actually able to go higher typically with fewer symptoms. And I thought, as my hair started turning gray, wow, this is something to really look forward to at altitude, that People tend to do better at altitude as they get older. And I was very excited about that. And in fact, it's definitely true. And I won't bore you or your viewers with stories, but I can tell you that going to the same base camps that I would go to on a climb, whatever it was, uh, I would notice, wow, I used to always get sick my first night here and I feel great until I started learning about the intracranial dynamics that lead to the fact that we feel better at, as we get older. And it turns out that when you go to altitude, there are a lot of changes, but often there is an increase in cerebral blood flow, increase in blood flow to the brain. And uh, as you get older, your ventricles, um, which are these big spaces in your brains in a normal person that contains cerebral spinal fluid, as your brain atrophies, those spaces get bigger and bigger and bigger. Essentially, your brain is disappearing. So your brain becomes more compliant. So when you increase the blood flow to your brain and your brain is more compliant, you can take on more fluid into your brain before you start seeing increases in intracranial pressure. So in other words, your brain is getting smaller. So you can withstand uh, more fluid with less pressure. So it's great that now I feel better at altitude, but when I think about why it is, because my brain's smaller, it doesn't make yeah. me happy. No, no um, not so good. <laughs> but, but, but in answer to the question, yeah, as, as we age, more oxygen is a good thing at altitude, and it just helps with cerebration or thinking. And, you know, you can just study cognition, and I've been involved in neuropsychiatric studies on older versus younger pilots, and the aging brain has more trouble often with cognition. And uh, so oxygen is a good thing in that regard. And that's kind of a generic question, and I hope I didn't disappoint your, your viewer, but that's the easiest way to put it. Yeah, no, that's great. I'm just, um, I'm going to move through, I'm going to kind of shift topics a little bit because I know we only have you for a certain amount of time. And um, I know that you and I are talking about doing something a little bit longer than a 30-minute session because every time we do this, we run out. Did you figure out a day or a time or anything yet? You know, I, I decided I want to talk to you because whatever it is that you and I do, I really want it to be good. And uh, I suffer from something called uh, obsessive paralysis. So uh, when I have an option to do something like this, I have a thousand ideas. And so maybe it'll take a Jason Miller to say, hey, let's just do something. But right now I have a lot of ideas about making this really good. All right. All right. Well, we'll talk about it. And maybe by tomorrow we'll have something figured out, some place we can really stretch out on this stuff because I hate to rush you. Um, but I did want to get to a couple questions about vision. Somebody was asking about, I don't even know if I can find it here, so I'm going to paraphrase. My apologies to whoever wrote this. Um, diabetes, type 2 diabetes and pilot vision. And I know you're not an AME, um, so questions about whether or not you get, you know, get your medical or whatever. I'm not really asking that, I guess, but how does diabetes play in? So I can, I can actually speak to that. Um, and yes, I'm not an AME, but... Something very interesting, and maybe the viewer that wrote that question already knows this, that as of, I believe, November of uh, 2019, which is very recent, um, the FAA is now allowing type 1 diabetics to pass uh, potentially their class 1 and class 2 uh, medical. And uh, 
So there are two issues without going into a lot of detail on diabetes. Diabetes can, can cause long-term issues with your vision because of blood flow, for example, to your retina. And, and people with diabetes can end up with all sorts of retinal problems with their vision and stuff, and those are long-term. But people with out-of-control blood sugar can also have acute changes in their vision, typically associated with high sugar, where it changes the amount of fluid in your crystalline lens, in your intraocular lens, and, and it can create refractive problems. All I'm saying is blood sugar out of control can equal blurry vision, even if you have good retinas. Hmm. So the FAA was really not very excited about having type 1 diabetics flying commercial airliners. But now... In the last decade, and especially in the last few years, there have been huge advances in, in continuous blood monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring, CGM is what doctors call it. And uh, because CGM now has become so precise, uh, the FAA, and this was largely through efforts by organizations like AOPA and others, the FAA is now allowing for a... Uh, forget what it's called, but when they make an allowance. And, uh, and so I talked to an AME, interestingly, today, who happens to be a friend. And as of yesterday, there have now been two pilots, the first two that have been authorized with class one and class two uh, medicals with type one, meaning glucose dependent, I'm sorry, insulin dependent diabetes uh, that have gotten their type their uh, class one, too many numbers here, their type, their, their class one medical. Um, okay. Can you clarify that a little bit to you, the difference between type one and type two? I'm sure people that have it know, but I don't. So. It's a little more complicated than this, but the simple way to define the difference is typically type one, insulin dependent, requiring injections of insulin to lower your blood sugar. Type two, generally, you don't need insulin. You can take oral anti-hyperglycemics, things to lower your blood sugar orally, and they can control your blood sugar just with medication. So um, typically type 1, this isn't always true, starts when you're young. It's a lifelong issue. That's not always true, but often. And type 2 often begins later in adulthood. Okay, that's great. Um and I should say, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but if you are a diabetic, type 1, and you want to fly commercially, and maybe the person that asked the question is, um, there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, I can send you, Jason, links to that stuff if you want to get the, that, that information to your viewers. Yeah, definitely. Um, that'd be great. And I also wanted to ask, um, and by the way, anybody that's watching that feels like, you want to hear more here. The Instagram that we did this morning is still out there. So if you can find it on Instagram, it's live for 24 hours. And then all the uh, archive stuff for the live Instagrams is on Patreon. And Howard, what about LASIK? Uh, so um, <laughs> the good news, I think the good news, we all know, you know, you've seen the billboards, LASIK, you know, make your vision great again. Maybe there's a <laughs> hat for that. Um, going there. The problem with LASIK, LASIK is there are complications. And if you look at the statistics, the statistics look better than the actuality. How can that be? Because if you're just testing refraction, most people, I mean, there are complications, but most people do better with LASIK. But a lot of people have issues that are persistent, including dry eyes, including halos around lights, problems with double images, you know, landing at night and such. So, you know, I'm not an ophthalmologist, but what I would tell, you know, my patients or my friends or my students is if you've got really bad eyes with a lot of astigmatism and you have trouble with contact lenses and your eyes are kind of a mess, I think LASIK or PRK, which is photorefractive keratotomy, is, uh, is a reasonable consideration. But if you're a pilot with 20-20 vision, correctable, with glasses or contacts, and you have pretty good vision, um, I guess, and this is, you know, whatever they say on the internet, IMHO, you know, in my humble opinion, um, I, would think tw I would think twice 
about uh, refractive surgery just because of the potential for persistent symptoms, even if they correct your vision. So I would talk to a surgeon, not just a person that you see on a billboard driving to work, but uh, a refractive surgeon that specializes in pilot vision and, uh, and, and start there. And that fancy word you said in the middle, was so, that just another, that's a fancy way of saying LASIK or was that another no. alternative? So LASIK, you actually produce an epithelial flap. So you, you lift a flap of corneal epithelium, then you ablate the cornea itself, and then you bring the flap back down and, and at, reattach it. And the nice thing there is that all the pain associated with having your cornea ablated, there's really very little pain. You're almost immediately better. There are people that literally the next day have 20-20 vision without correction. So, you know, yay. But I know, for example, for the military, for special forces, I know for SEALs, they don't want LASIK because that flap, they're worried, could come apart again sometime later. And there have been cases where that flap separated downstream, for example, for SEALs that obviously dive and there are pressure issues. Um, so there's another technique that's actually older than LASIK, which is called PRK, photorefractive keratotomy. Sounds fancy, but it's actually a simple procedure relative to LASIK where there's no flap. They just grind away at your cornea. The good news is that's it. There's no flap. The bad news is you're in a lot of pain for many days following the procedure because it's your cornea, it's like having the worst, world's worst corneal abrasion. But when it heals, no flap, and it's considered to be safer. The other thing I'll mention is that if you talk to refractive surgeons, and I'm urging your listeners to do this, but there's some new lasers now, these new wavefront lasers that where they actually do a much more a uh, high resolution topography of your cornea prior to the surgery. So the results they're getting now are better than when people started doing LASIK, you know, almost two decades ago. Awesome. Well, hey, that brings us kind of to the end of our time. Unfortunately, I feel like I could talk to you here for, for days probably. Um, but uh, you're back on Instagram tomorrow, 9 a.m., right? We're going to yeah. talk about uh, emergencies at altitude. And, well, um, Go ahead. Yeah, specifically uh, how flight crews and cabin crews deal with medical emergencies on board. And, you know, possibly listeners are thinking, well, I'm not a commercial pilot. But it's pretty interesting, you know, the, the kinds of kits that are carried on commercial airliners. Do they carry oxygen? What kind of training do they get? What do the pilots do when there's a medical emergency? You know, how do they talk to the ground? You know, some of the stuff... Uh, I won't belabor it and make it really boring, but we'll just do a quick run through sort of some of the systems that are in place for commercial airliners. All right, I might have lost your audio there, but I think it's me. Um, anyway, Howard, if you can hear me, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate it. And uh, as always, thank you for your time. All right. I don't know if you guys can still hear me out there, if I'm still like a kung fu movie, but I want to thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to end this 